Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Again, good morning, friends. My name's Pat. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Uh, I'm a member of Tyree Group, and I live in Warhope. Now, you put two and two together. <laughs> um, it's beautiful to welcome all you people here this morning. This is our first meeting of AA this morning. It's the old-timers meeting. And before introducing your chairman for this morning, I'd like to read one announcement and also the preamble. The announcement, which you may have heard last night at the meeting, regards our tradition of personal anonymity at the public level. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, TV and films. Thus we respectfully ask that no AA speaker or indeed any AA member be identified by full name in published or broadcast reports of our meetings. The assurance of anonymity is essential in our efforts to help other problem drinkers who may wish to share our recovery program with us. And our tradition of anonymity reminds us that AA principles come before personalities. You know, usually I talk too much and I don't share enough. And I'd like to share something just to kick off. Gordon, would you read the preamble for us? Yes? Thank you, Pat. And good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Gordon and I'm an alcoholic. I come from Warialda. Hi, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, as Pat said, he'd like me to read the preamble. When, I, when AA came to me a good few years ago, um, the chairman used to always say, briefly and to the point. And I say it this morning, briefly and to the point. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting to our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. <clears throat> neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And without me getting all tied up and knots again, I'd like to now introduce your chairman, your chairperson for this morning, who is Alan of Unity Group. Newcastle, and I'll leave the meeting in Alan's hands. Apart from asking that all speakers, when you come up to speak, please speak in front of the microphones because these meetings have been recorded. And if you're on the other side of the table, they don't pick up so well. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. Believe me, this is entirely unrehearsed. My name is Alan, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a member of the Unity Group in Newcastle. I arrived here this morning, greeted by the fact that I was to chair this meeting, and that was the first I knew of it. That's why I say this is an entirely unrehearsed show. I am nervous, I'm emotional, because I've met a lot of people, so I'd ask you to bear with me, please. Uh, I've been around Alcoholics Anonymous a long time, 
There's a little confusion in my mind about years. I'm going to be brief about myself. I think I staggered into Burwood. Uh, the first meeting I ever went to in 1948. Uh, I suppose you can call it a, a success story. I heard a fellow in Newtown who I knew very well when we were younger and I knew him later in Alcoholics Anonymous and he was one of the best pugs, to use an expression that we all understand, that this country has ever known. His name was Bobby. A lot of you would remember him. And he said, you were never a true champion until you were knocked down and nearly out and got up and won. I have had a lot of years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous without going into a detailed story. I've had two breaks in my sobriety which cost me about two and a half years of sobriety uh, since that period of 1948. So I guess along the route somewhere I've had about 31 years sober, 31 and a half if you can count up quickly. And for this that I am entirely grateful. Uh, there's a lot of nostalgia in this for me chairing this meeting. It's a, a sentimental journey into the past, uh, into those days so long ago that <clears throat> when you get along in years like I am, you sort of yearn for those good old days and things ain't what they used to be like, you know. I ain't what it was. I think it's a pretty good thing that I ain't what it was too, you know. <laughs> yeah. We've progressed along the road. So many great improvements have been made. Uh, in the old days, I think we were a pretty intolerant bunch, but it wasn't because we didn't have compassion or understanding. It was because we didn't have knowledge. <clears throat> and we learned as we went along, we didn't know very much about alcoholism, and we didn't know very much about Alcoholics Anonymous and recovery. One thing we did know a lot about, and that was love, and we loved one another in a tremendous close, tremendously close fashion. And uh, that is one of the great things that I can look back and think about now. Uh, we've got a marvelous AA today. Uh, we've got people in Alcoholics Anonymous today uh, of all ages. of both sexes of all ages. And almost every mistake that could be made has been made. Any problem that anybody has within Alcoholics Anonymous today, there is an answer to from past experience. And this is what makes AA such a wonderful show now, that there's understanding. Anybody coming into un to Alcoholics Anonymous today will find understanding at their own particular level of alcoholism. Years ago we used to dream that the day would come when younger people particularly, but all people would come to Alcoholics Anonymous before they had reached the dereliction stage that most of us had in those days. And I think one way and another that has been achieved. And people coming to Alcoholics Anonymous today at any age and in any stage of alcoholism will get understanding at their own particular level. <laughs> in the early days, if you hadn't been a metho drinker, you know, you just weren't it. Uh, if you only drunk beer, you had difficulty in convincing the rest of us that you were an alcoholic. A periodic drunk, it took me a long time to understand a periodic drunk because he could he could stop drinking. I couldn't until I lived alongside one, just right next door to one. And then I understood that in three weeks he could make as just as big a mess of himself as I could. You know? So we didn't have much understanding a, a long time ago and I believe we have much more today. And for these things we should be pretty grateful, you know. I don't want to take too long because uh, there's a lot of 
people here. There's a lot of speakers who I'd like to call. I'm nervous whilst I'm cooling down a little bit about having a bump on me before the meeting. Uh, but I'm settling down and I said thanks for, or I do say thanks for bearing with me. And uh, I've got to think about speaking. Uh, some I don't that will be here that I know that I don't even remember. I've met some now. Uh, so bear with me in this situation too. The first one that I would like to call is, uh, I've got a list of some people here, is uh, Sailor Bill. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, Bill's my name. I'm dead scared to myself. I'm very happy to be here today uh, with the crowd, and uh, it's a terrific feeling. I won't keep you long at all. I've uh, I've had a great joy with AA for many years, and I I uh, the first of this coming May I'll be with AA for 29 years, and it's been a pretty wonderful time ever since the first meeting I ever went to. Just a very little, and uh, and then I'll sit down and listen to some of the other people. I. Uh, I drank when I was awfully young. I, I drank when I was uh, 14, and I uh, deteriorated to the to the night I got to AA. I, uh, I'd uh, I'd been a shocking type of a drunk. I'd uh, ended up a derelict in the park, and uh, you know you'd see me most times outside the ship in, cold biting people. And uh, there was little on the menu for me and for my family. I had a wife and children, and. Uh, Pretty awful right through our, uh, my drinking life. Uh, we never had a home. St. Vincent de Paul fed me kiddies and my missus, and she went out scrubbing floors in that early of a morning, and uh, late of a night she'd be sitting up at the park, frightened to come back to the little room that we lived in because I'd be drunk. But thank God uh, she found AA for me, and we went to a meeting one Friday night in the city of Sydney, uh, uh, the Exchange Hotel. It was a hotel. And uh, there was the, uh, the I, I believe that was the greatest night that God ever put on the face of the earth for me and for my family. We fell in love with AA, or at least I fell in love, so did she. We fell in love with AA the very first meeting we went to. It was most remarkable for me because I, uh, I didn't understand very much. And uh, so much was said that night. Uh, the feeling was beautiful. I, I cried inside me and outside too for the whole of the meeting and so did she and uh, beautiful things were said. The man who was in the chair was a bloke called Ben from New Guinea. He read out the preamble and I uh, this appealed to me. I loved what I heard and uh, then he made the statement of all statements. He said uh, tonight, he said, I can give you people living proof that AA works. And I sat up and I took notice, I'll tell you, for I was a terribly sick person. And uh, I heard a, a cross-section of the community who spoke that night, and it amazed me, uh, a doctor spoke, and, and a priest spoke, and I couldn't imagine these kind of people being alcoholics. I could could imagine myself a bum, you know, but these people said they were alcoholics. They talked about the suffering that they'd gone through, and I, I understood only too well then. Um, but they talked about the recovery, and it was pretty beautiful to listen to. My wife was with me. Uh, she'd had a shocking life because of my drinking. She was very close to a mental institution. And uh, we sat in a couple of rows back from the front, and somebody from the hall, uh, from the meeting said that alcoholics were not bad people or, or weak people. They were terribly sick. And, you know, for many years she'd blame me for the way I was. And it's understandable, you know, if you only had a look at my children and the position we were in to to, uh, to understand her, you know, she, uh, she blamed me for the way we were. You know, there was nothing in my children's faces, only fear and tears, you know. And this person said alcoholics were not bad or weak, they were sick, terribly, terribly sick. And uh, it, it was it was then that she grabbed all of my hand while we were sitting there and she squeezed it. And she was more or less saying to me, Bill, she said, uh, she was more or less saying, Bill, I'm sorry for the way I thought of you all these years. You know, she was uh, forgiving me, and it was a pretty beautiful thing to listen to. Because somebody, as I said, the person said this, they also said, that, you know, that uh, we didn't want to be the way we were. 
And God only knows I didn't ever want to be the way I was. I always wanted to be decent. I come from a home of alcoholics. You know, there was nothing, only misery in the place I come from. It was always booze out of a weekend, little food for us kids, and less. there was less clothes too. And I grew up in this kind of an atmosphere, and I never wanted to be like that. But this was the night we sat at our first meeting, and, and she squeezed my hand. And, you know, before we even went to the meeting, there was no love left in our life. It was a terrible hate, you know. And you can understand only too well, but from the very first meeting, you know, the love come back into our life. We sat and we loved it and we listened and it was the most beautiful thing that ever happened in our life. And we took it home with us. A bloke come back with us. He, he lived in the same uh, tram line as we did. The trams were running. And, and he got off the same stop as we did. He lived further on and he said to me, Bill, are you working? I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, look, stick this couple of quid in your kick. It'll buy you some smokes. And it was a bloody beautiful feeling. A really beautiful feeling to think that anybody would want to do this to a bloke like me. And I didn't take it, and I thought, you know, this is about the first decent thing I've ever done in my life, is knock back a couple of quid. And I went home terribly, terribly happy. We sat on the bed in this room that we lived in. It was a camp stretch in one corner, and there was an iron cot in the other, and we had a double bed in the middle of this room. And we sat on the, on the, on the bed. The kids were asleep, thank God. We'd, I rushed back, frightened. We'd left them on their own. They were babies. And, you know, uh, we rushed up the stairs and they were asleep, thank God. The little girl was supposed to be a grown-up. She had to be that way. And, and uh, I looked into the faces the very first night as they were asleep and I prayed to God. And, and I didn't even understand. I didn't even know how to pray. And I said, please, give me a go. I said, give me a go if it's only for the sake of these two kids. And I was asking for what I'd seen there that night. And we sat on the bed and I asked her the meaning of many of the words on the program I didn't understand. And she explained them to me. And each time our eyes would meet, we'd start to cry. And, you know, they were real tears of joy. They were not tears of pity. We'd brought home something that was very, very beautiful. We'd never had it in our life before, and we knew that it was real, and we knew that with it, something was going to happen in our life, and something did. You know, since then, life has been pretty beautiful. Kids have grown up. They have lots of kids of their own. We have a pretty mighty life, you know. And I suppose the greatest thing that's ever happened to me was Last year, I was uh, fortunate enough to go to the International Convention in New Orleans and stand with, say, I don't know how many people, but, but, but maybe there was 30,000 people who stood up and they said the serenity prayer, and I was one of them. And this is what AA has done. Besides that, many beautiful things has happened. And, and God only knows if there's anybody here, you know, that's uh, coming along early on, please have a go of it because it's very, very beautiful. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, is there a, a, an Anne from Etalon here? I'm Anne. I live at Etalon, retired, in a nice little red brick house. I own, through AA, this wonderful fellowship and all you lovely members and Eleanor, children, all my friends. Oh, I'm heck of a jittery, but still I'll say it. I don't think it's really right, but I joined AA in 1951 as a derelict on my way to be uh, to the orange or what to be, uh, you know, uh, committed. My sister was uh, making a way and we didn't get on. I said, I'll beat her, I'll go myself. Because I was just a vegetable. I couldn't say yes, I couldn't say no. I heard about Clive through AA and a good gentleman friend of mine, he cried over me. He loved me, whom I had. He was a uh, legally uh, separated uh, on the verge of divorce man, and uh, I wasn't doing his wife any harm. That's, I worried about that. I was And uh, he loved me, and he went up to a chemist 
And I said, I only get on this bender when you go overseas on business. But this time you've caught me, you're back a few days before you should be. There you go. And I was really, I had been on a chronic bender, drinking to the last. Wine from up the road, the slide rock, 15 shillings, well laced with metho. And I knew, because the good friend's neighbours told me, why, Anne, you have worked in hotels. You are drinking metho. I said, I don't know, and I don't care. I, I drink to die. And I'd uh, tried the suicide twice. It didn't come off. The gas oven and the harbour. It was not meant to be. And we are born alcoholics. I, I should say, not we. Because I was a bit way out as a child. My mother would say, out of my six children... I never understand this one. And I resented my mother because uh, there were six of us children. Some of the elders were working. And Uncle Joe, Dad's bachelor brother, and my aunt's boyfriend with a big old lovely house on an island on the northwest of England in the Irish Sea. It belonged to England. And we had to go to the mainland by ferry boat, which I could row the boat at 12, me and another girl, a boatman made us do it. Fish, I used to fish. I loved that island. I loved my upbringing. My father was gentle, a good man, and nursed me as a child, put his arms round me. My mother was of the Viking, the direct Vikings landed on our island. Tough, hard, no kiss, no love. And that I resented because there was the alcoholic makeup, the sensitiveness, the emotions, all the makeup we have and still will have till we die. But we've got to face them. We've got AA helps us in all these. I won't say they're defects of character, they're not. They're just, we're just born like it. In the old days it was said, we have a gland here, which makes us that we cannot take one glass of alcohol. And one, and I ha joined AA in 1951. Ross, I got from Clive up the North Shore line by telephone, told me to go to Ross that lived at Glebe Point. I just bought over a big derelict of a guest house, meaning to take students from the uni, work and get sober. I'd left the place at Lavender Bay where I had the war and the Yanks, plenty of booze, help yourself, Anne. I helped myself and head. First I'd take a, a glass in with me and a couple of glasses out of each bottle. Then I'd water it. Then I'd take the lot. That's the progression of downs, no ups, downs as a progressive alcoholic. And that was in 1951, about the end of the war, I think. Now, I don't say it with ego. It's not the length of sobriety. And I try to keep the, the uh, quality of my sobriety. I like a little bit of the pokies. But I'm, I'm in there with $2. My brother visits me. He's retired now. I have a very nice flat at Lane Cove with my invalid sister and uh, he comes up to see me once a month. He never did much before. I've been in that long. I bought this small house. 
lovely little brick house with a beautiful garden of oranges, lemons, roses, flowers. I love gardening to my hobby. And I feel free as the air and the kookaburras, the bellbirds, the whipbirds, the crows, the sparrows all around me wake me up early, but I don't mind the birds waking me up. But now I am 20, 31 years next month sober. <laughs> Thank you. It seems about one. Time has flown. I look at the TV and watch my special programs at night that say, don't tell me it's Friday already. Thursday night's my main night. I farming breed from my mother and I love all creatures great and small. I wouldn't miss that for anything. And then I watch the good old Cockney Hazel after that. They're my two favourite programs. I like a bit of a thrill, the detective, the guns and... <laughs> All that. I like all that. And I've travelled worldwide through my various enterprises, buying and selling. And when my solicitor in Sydney, I had them for a few years, I had to have them naturally for conveyance, said, you have worked miracles with your real estate. I said, oh, I never thought of that word in real estate. But I was. I didn't know it. Because I've got an inferiority complex. I'm a heck of a talker. But I don't gossip. If I have anything to say to somebody up the road that drives me, gets told off, this is my weapon. But it can be pretty strong at times without swearing. I don't mind a bit of a B, but anything else. Out. is out but I, I don't know I frighten them <laughs> because they look at me and if they've known me before they, they think oh, the old grey man's not what I thought she was you know I got plenty of kick yes I'm 78 years of age and I am proud and if it wasn't for this if I wasn't an alcoholic, I would not have been able to go around the world, America twice, Japan twice, six months sober, go to Salon to start a group. All the islands I've been to, Bangkok, you know. I'm just back from Bali. I thought, blow, I'll spend up on the pension. I'm due for the pension and I want the pension. <laughs> because... In my sober days, I've played my taxation. I've got a, a real qualified man to do it. And it's owing me. But now, there are plenty of things. I've, uh, oh, had, I've had cancer 10 years ago, gone. I'm not meant to die. I'm meant to go on, carry on. And the main thing that got me sober was no central office was from Glebe Point, I got my boarding house going. I made it a beautiful house, made it into five or six small flats, and I had mostly students. And I took three welfare boys straight from the home, and my brother's boy, of a child of three, who his mother went, and my brother was a naval chap. But unfortunately, he's got peas four years ago. He died, of course, of cough disease, wet brain. But his boy's grown up now. He's grown up a fine man. And I looked after him well. Discipline and kindness. But discipline too. He's grown up a fine man uh, with uh, five children now married, 40 of them. But, uh, and I think it's mostly through AA that's taught me, taught me to Love these unwanted welfare state wards and help them start off in life at 15 years of age or working in uh, engineering shops. I made them bath before dinner. I washed for them, fed them, had a lovely big 
garage made into a big bed sitter with a little stove in. The room done every day made them live a good, clean life, a start. And I made a good job, I'm sure. And each day, I, each week, I'll say a little prayer. I got one or two. They joined the Army and the Navy, which was good for them later, that they're well and they don't turn out like their poor parents, sick alcoholics or in jail were. And they'd tell me about them and I'd say, this is your life. They are not, you are away. You have your life to live. And you have me. They didn't know I was an alcoholic and I joined AA and all their AA philosophy, the ways I was beginning to live, changed my life, get new friends in AA, taught me to pass it on. And what got me mainly sober, they put me on a heck of a lot of 12-step work. From Glee Point to Balmain, a girl, she'd been on the streets, she'd got everything uh, to take her to the hospital to have treatment, and different ones with climbing through windows, wet beds, fish and chip papers, empty spaghetti tins, empty plonk bottles, empty methyl bottles, the same old pattern. That was often, but I took a delight, and they were never in that room. I'd ring up matron at Langton Clinic, who was a darling, the first matron, I forget her name, and she said, Anne, bring them in. It was none of this, take them in to show them to, like, last doctor there. He's retired now. I'd bring them in, I'd bring an ambulance, and sometime one bloke said one day, I was out at Maruba at uh, the council flats, and he said, oh, we know her. I said, do you really? And I said, she's sick. I said, oh. I said, look, don't speak like that about her. I too am an alcoholic, but for the grace of God, I'm sober. I too have been like that. And he never said a word. And I, I was that glowing inside when Matron met at me at the top of the stairs in the ambulance and with me, poor old darling, in the ambulance. And she said, third floor, this way. And he muttered and swore to himself and said, I'm damn glad you've got to carry it three floors up. The, the, you know, the, the niggly bit that's in there because she was a pretty hefty woman, a qualified accountant. And I was glad he had to take her up three fourths, she was heavy. But there was there was two of them. There was two of them on the she was on the stretcher. And I thanked her after and told her how I felt. <laughs> and she said, Good on you, Anne. Any time you ring up I know they want to be hospitalized. I said, Oh, I mean some abuse. But that did me good to see. And today I, I suffer with fright because I went through the hell. The DTs, the suicide attempts, drinking methylated spirits with wine, but it was still methyl. No bath for up to three weeks a month, my bender, never out of bed. Call out at night for dry bread crusts in the kitchen. Nobody must see me. I couldn't. I couldn't go out. And uh, I, uh, uh, the, underneath my bed, you couldn't put a shoe between for empty bottles. But I got out of it, joined AA, gradually started, sold that house for a thousand pounds. I paid 115 for Cleaned it up. I worked like a slave, like the alcoholic. Well, workaholics too, you know. And I uh, uh, cleaned it up and got a thousand pound for it. Bought, borrowed a thousand from the bank. Bought a two thousand big old home, derelict, in Glee Point, and made it beautiful. Had it thirteen years. Sold it for ten or twelve thousand. And I've gone on and on. Yes. But anyway, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm speaking too long. But I'm so grateful to be here. And 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to put that back up. How can you deny it? Come and attend to your... See if you can hook that back up for me. Will you keep it up? Here, uh, Ann. Long John from Surface Paradise. Because they're here for me, please. Thanks, Alan. Well, good morning, friends. I'm uh, Long John Silver. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm sober today. That's the main thing. I've been one of the lucky ones that I've been sober, actually, since my first meeting. But that came afterwards. I was never going to drink. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. I saw what it did to him. I saw it absolutely destroy a wonderful, beautiful man. And I was never going to be like that because I was never going to drink. But I did. I picked one up at the age of 25. From then on, it was nothing but trouble. I grew up in a big country town. I acquitted myself quite well in that town. I was quite... Um, and had no crazy hang-ups. I was just an ordinary run-of-the-mill fellow that could do anything that was necessary, anything that bobbed up. So that I never came into alcoholics and I was any hang-ups or anything else. I was just one thing. I was an alcoholic. I believe, my belief, born that way. But uh, it took a long while for me to get to that stage. I, I drank, as I say, uh, I never started drinking when I was 25. And I handled it quite well because I never stayed and got chickened. I used to get out of the pub, I'd have a couple of drinks and clear out. And that was the way, because I knew what booze could do. I was frightened of booze. I was scared stiff of booze. I'm still scared of it too, just quietly. But the point was this, that I tried myself out one night at a party up in Nye West in Victoria. And I discovered I could drink. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me, because I lost all fear of booze. And I just carried on. I went along down like that for a year or two until one day a chap stopped me in the street and thanked me for taking him home from a party. And I didn't even remember him being at the party, let alone taking him home. And I said, oh, I'm getting like Dad. I'm getting like the old man. Time I did something about And I tried to stop. And I did stop for a while. Then I started again. This was a pattern for a long while. And it was progressively getting worse. And then I started to think about my dad. How did he live? How did he manage to survive as an alcoholic and still survive well? And I realised he was a vendor drinker, periodic drinker. And that's what I became because I had no, there's no way in the world that I could drink like other people and drink every day. So I became a vendor drinker and I was like that probably for the last nearly 30 years of my drinking. Progressively getting worse, getting uh, older of course naturally and, and suffering more with the booze. Suffering is the word I'm talking about today as an alcoholic. Because we get to that stage and we do suffer, there's no question about that. But I was fortunate enough that uh, I, 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 a chap came out to see me and offered me Alcoholics Anonymous. I was too cocky to even think about Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew it existed. I knew I, I existed. I used to hear it on the radio from 5K Adelaide many, many, many years ago. And if I was drunk, I'd have it turned up that the whole world could hear this program they put on of recovery. And if I was sober, I'd, in one of my sober periods, I'd have the radio turned down so that I didn't want my wife to know I was interested. You know, crazy, how crazy you can be. <laughs> but however, that sort of, I think, sowed the seed of Alcoholics Anonymous in me. It was many years after before I got, finally got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, this chap came out anyway to see me, and I wasn't home. I'd been on a bender for three weeks. My last bender, thank God, I hope. And uh, when he came out, my wife used to always protect me. She, he said, there's Jack about anywhere, and she said, oh, he's somewhere around the property. I don't know where he is. She didn't know where I was because I'd been gone three weeks. But the point was this, that uh, she took them in for a cup of tea, this, these two chaps, and they, she said, what did you really want to see him about? As a matter of fact, we want to see if he'll join Alcoholics Anonymous. And of course, then the cat was out of the bag. Mother opened up and told them what I was like, that I'd been missing for days, didn't know where I was or what I'd done. And uh, he said, I'll come back and have a look and see if he's home tomorrow. He came back on the Sunday morning. And my wife was trying to get off to church. I'd, I'd busted my own car up during that period, and I came home and pinched her halfway through the, somewhere through the night, you know, and why I'd bolted again with her car. But anyway, this chap came on the Sunday morning, just he was, he was going to run her into church. I turned up, pulled into the backyard, and I don't remember one single incident of this. I was told this afterwards. I pulled in there full as a tick, with a carload of grog, and uh, they took me out, took me into the kitchen. Mother went off to church and left me with this fellow. 
And when she came home, I was asleep at the end of the kitchen table and he'd gone. But something must have got through, drunk and all as I was. Because when she woke me up to get me out of the road in case any friends arrived for the afternoon, the first thing I said was, I'm going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous tomorrow night. Don't let me forget. So what happened, I don't know. The miracle happened anyway. Anyway, when on the Monday morning I came to my senses, I, I, I thought, my God, how long have I been on it? And what day is it? And, you know, I didn't know what was going on. So I've got to get off it. I've got to get off it again. I've done this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. I've never hospitalised. I'd get myself off it, wean myself off it. So I stayed in bed and I was having a nibble through the day just to, you know, just so I wouldn't collapse altogether and go into the horrors. And <coughs> About six o'clock, my wife came in. She said, come on up, you get, she said, and get yourself ready for that meeting. I said, I couldn't go. I'm too ill, I'm too sick, I'm too shaky, which I was. You can imagine, three weeks right on it. But anyway, she got under my skin. She said, oh, yes, the man of your word. You pride yourself on being a man of your word. You're going to let this man down when he comes. With that, I got up and had a shave and a shower and got dressed. Had a bit of a nibble, and uh, he turned up, and uh, I tried to get out of it. I tried every conceivable way to get out. I said, look, Jack, I'm not fit to go. I don't know who'll be there. I'm ashamed of myself. It's just impossible. And he said, have you got any booze left here? And I said, yes. Well, he said, get some in here. And that won me. That won me, my friend. It, it did. Because I thought, this bloke, he's not just a do-gooder. He's a fair dinker milk. He knows I need booze. He knows how sick I am. And I had a couple of plugs at this. And finally, we left there to go to the meeting. On the way out through the kitchen to the back door, the brains of this whiskey were sitting on the kitchen table. And his words were to me, stick it in your kick and bring it with you. He saw me looking longly at it, I think, was what it was all about. I went out of that meeting, and uh, I had a bit of a sip at it on the way out. And when we got out there, we got out of the car, ready to go into the meeting, and I still started to jack up. I still didn't want to go. I was, uh, look, uh, perhaps we better leave it for another night. You know, all this sort of crazy business. And he said, get some more of that booze into you. And I picked the bottle up, and I bugled down what was left in it, and I threw it in the hedge at the back of that church. And thank God that's the last thing I've found in necessary to have. In there I found people like myself. I found people I could relate to. Thank God they were alcoholics. There was no fancy pants there or anything. It was just straight down the line fellows that I could, I could, I could associate with and realise what they were doing. The chairman said anyone can leave here tonight and he'd never drink again. If they, if they so desire, but it's up to the individual. We can't do it. We've got no magic wands. But he said, the way we do it, we keep away from the first drink. We get the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and we keep it simple. You know, you couldn't get any more simple than that. That's what he told me. And I said, this is where I belong. This is where a practical way where I can live with my alcoholism is with these people. And I went along with this. I remember they gave me the big book to take out from that meeting. They gave me the big book to take home and read. And I remember old Jimmy H. Bobby knows him well. He's been sober now about 28 years or more. And I was starting to head out with this book, and Jimmy said, uh, be careful of that book now, John. And I said, yeah, I'll look after it. He said, I don't mean that at all. He said, I mean, be careful of it. Don't let it put you up the pole. And I said, what do you mean? He said, now, in the front of that, he said, there's about 160 pages of philosophy. In the back of the book, there's 37 stories of recovery, people like yourself. That's what you'll understand. You won't understand the other at all. You won't know what it's all about. And he said, if you read those stories, you'll be able to relate to these people. You will know what you are. And you'll be able to go along with it. But God's sake, handle the book carefully. In other words, keep it simple. It was the story, the message. I've gone along and done that. I read those books, things when I went home. And that's been the basis of my sobriety since I came in. But to keep it simple, keep with me. I've never got away from my eye. It's just on 20 years since I had my last drink from that first meeting, shaky, sick and everything as I was. How the hell I never went into the horrors, I'll never know. Chop it off like I did, but it was the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that kept me alive, I think, for that next week. Two chaps come out, there was a mob turn up out of my home at 10, uh, 10 o'clock the next morning after my first meeting. Just blowing through, you know, you know the old story. Just blowing through, all right, but they come in at a cup of tea. In the afternoon, there was another batch arrived, and this is the way it was in those days. The sponsorship, the fellowship was absolutely fantastic. Thank God it was, or I wouldn't be here today. But I'm, uh, I was lucky enough then to see my two remaining brothers come into Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd already lost two brothers with booze. I saw them come into Alcoholics Anonymous and get sober and stay sober. Bill was 12 years sober when he died. Big Gordon, a lot of you will know, was 18 years sober on the 11th of last November. 
The one that rang the bell room sitting there, little Bobby Gordon, went a very cocky, very big business job, you know, and very full of himself with a red face and all. And Bobby went up to him and he said, you haven't troubled the booze, mate, are you? And he said, oh, no, I'm just here to help my brothers. He said, you never got that bloody face eating strawberries, mate. And, and there it was, there it was. This is the way this thing happened in those days. And thank God we've still got a lot of it around the day. But it's been the greatest single incident in my life, I believe, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. A hopeless, chronic alcoholic, sick with booze, really sick. Today I'm still a chronic alcoholic, but I don't suffer with alcoholism today. I don't suffer because I don't drink. It's as simple as that. It's a practical, simple way for us to live, and if we can only get hold of it, this is the main thing. I believe my salvation, when I went to that first meeting, I read that first step. And I read it a little differently, perhaps, but I read it, we admit it, we were powerless over alcohol. And as a result of that, my life was unmanaged. That's the way I read it. Because I still had a good property. I still had a couple of cars. I still had a family that, that loved me and pitied me. Uh, this is the way I came into it. See, and I could have said, well, my life's got to be managed when we have these things. But then I'd remember the time when I'd go out to the sale yard and buy stock in blackout. Wouldn't know I'd bought them. And I'd come to from a vendor and I'd go down the paddock. First thing I did and I got sober was to go around the property and see what had happened while I'd been on the booze. And later I'd find a pile of cattle I didn't know anything about. And my wife would say, well, your carrier brought them out after the sale. So there, how can your life be managed when you're doing things like that? But thank God for us, it's a fantastic, marvellous, wonderful thing. But treat it as a practical, there's nothing airy-fairy about it. There's none of this, you don't have to grow wings in AA or any other damn thing. You do the practical thing. You keep away from the first drink. So Zelman Cowan had the game sign up there last night, he told us all. That keep away from the first drink. If you keep away from the first drink, you've got a chance. If you don't, you've got no chance. None whatever. Neither have I. If I went out and picked one up today, I'll be dead in three or four days. That's what happened to me. But at my age of life, I'm, I'm just about as old as Dan, as a matter of fact. But uh, I'm still happy. I'm still capable of doing things that I want to do, still able to help people where I can. And, and it's all been the most marvellous thing that ever happened to me and to my family. Today my family love me and respect me. There's a big difference in loving and pity. I've got three grandkids, the eldest one's 20. They've never seen me drunk. They think I'm the greatest old buck that ever lived. And it'll break their heart if I drink. It'll break mine too. But thank God for all you good people, the marvellous people. I feel like a juvenile here when I hear these others talking for 30 years and that sort of thing. But the main thing, it doesn't matter how long, so long as we're sincere in what we're doing and so long as we try and do what it tells us in that preamble. That's the roadmap to sobriety for me, the preamble of Alcoholics Anonymous. To keep sober and try and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety, and give them back a little bit of what we've been fortunate enough to get. We're the luckiest people on God's earth to be here this morning. Whether we're still drinking or whether we're not, we know, at least from today on, there's an answer to alcoholism. And all I can say in closing, even if you reject this thing today, please, God, don't forget it. Because somewhere along the line, if you're an alcoholic and you don't die, you'll be back here because you've got me and nowhere else to go. you like me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Is Irina here? Is Irina Crooks here? Is Anne from Bondi here? I have a message for Irina. If anybody... The first people who I became friendly with <coughs> in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous was a native of Armadale. As soon as it's a, a town we're in is Armadale, I'll tell you a little about him. He was a wonderful character, a lovable chap, and a humorist. <clears throat> and I thought about him yesterday morning when I was on the way here. I came here by train and I remember him telling us in Alcoholics Anonymous about one time he caught a train from the same town as I caught to 
come up here in Newcastle. And I were in the box carriage days. A lot of you here will remember the box carriage days. They were just an oblong box with two seats facing each other. A couple of pictures underneath the rack, the uh, rack and a mirror in the centre of the of the line. And he said he got into this train at Newcastle and sat down. And he said a man and a woman sitting in opposite corners had a look at him, gathered up their things and got out of the carriage. And he said over in the other corner he said there's a well-dressed fellow sitting there reading the paper. He said he put the paper down looked over his glasses at him, gathered up his things, got out of the carriage. He said, I got up and I looked in the mirror and I got out of the carriage. <laughs> I'd like to call a very old member I think we can almost call him a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but he's not really, and goes to great lengths to deny this too. Not because he doesn't want to be, he'd love to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it'd cost him too much, but we all love him, he's well known, and we'd like to hear just a little from him, Arch McKinnon. Hello everyone, I'm Archie McKinnon, I'm not an alcoholic, I've been around AA for a long time, like the previous speakers I'm a bit emotionally upset over this weekend, this weekend was a, a realization of a dream the three men had 37 years and one month and a couple of days ago we had a dream that this story the philosophy of AA might spread all over this country of ours We weren't too sure if it wasn't a, a pipe dream. Excuse me, look, I am a bit upset over this weekend. Uh, but I hope I get a bit better as I go along because I'm going to talk a bit too. The others. Uh, Maybe I can tell you something about myself, so I will explain how I got involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. <coughs> I was a young man in the early Depression. My background was rural. My people were breeders of sheep. And kicking around my uncle's properties, I learned to shear sheep. And didn't think much about it, because young men pick up skills and they just forget about them. But when there was no work available for any man, no matter what his talents were, when there were doctors out of Maroubra who were shoveling sand to get a pittance to live on, I got a job with a shearing company as a wool roller, piece picker. And I soon remembered, or I started to pick up the hand piece and I started to shear again, and finally I became a fully blown shearer. And we used to start up in Long Reach in January of every year and we would shear our way right down to the Snowy River pretty well and pull it, filling in a whole year and I was earning a lot of money when the basic wage was about £3.10 a week if you had a job and a lot of people didn't have a job. And I followed this occupation for five years. 22 
until I was 27 years of age. I, my brother had a small property at Morristown where he was running a few cattle and slowly starting to death. And I paid him a visit and I hung around there a bit, you know. And I was a, the life of a year in those days wasn't the greatest life in the world. It was pretty rough, even though you weren't earning a lot of money. And there was a young red-headed woman teaching one of these little schools that, you know, abounded in the country in those days. And I started to hang around and I hung around and I finally decided I didn't want to be a shearer anymore. And I learned to cut sleepers. And if anyone knows anything about sleeper cutting, well, there is just about. It's the end of the, of the track. There's nothing worse. And I stuck it for 12 months. And I think this teacher, who I wasn't making a great deal of headway with, <laughs> she said to me, they've opened a new ward down in Morrisette. What about going down and applying for a job? And uh, I said, you know, fellow the ruling background, going to work in a lunatic asylum. And I said, oh, no, you know, not for me. But anyhow, she pushed me. I borrowed a horse and I rode down and I filled in an application form. And uh, the medical superintendent who interviewed you, and he looked around at me, I had gone to one of the GPS schools and I must have been the first GPS school graduate had ever applied for a job in a mental hospital, which was the end of the labour market. Nearly lower than shearing and sleeper cutting. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, after talking about the rowing and the cricket and all this, he said to me, I'll give you, I'll ring you up or send you a wire in about 10 days uh, and telling you where to start. He didn't even follow it along any further, so I started at Morissette Mental Hospital. Well, when I got there, it's hard to look back and describe the condition in those days. They were shocking. There were no treatments, and the psychotic patients were, they were frightening. They used to frighten me. Uh, I, I just couldn't understand insanity. But in that hospital, there were always about a hundred alcoholics under the Inebrid Act. And I found that I related to these people. I was able to talk to them, understand them, and I mixed with them very freely. I passed my three years exams, and that's a story which I'll mention later. And <clears throat> there was a job going at the Darlinghurst Reception House, and I applied for this job, and I got it. Well, when I got there, I found that the <coughs> more than <coughs> excuse me <coughs> more than a third of the patients admitted to this hospital were alcoholics and I saw them there in the crude state you know in the DPs uh, all the conditions associated with alcoholism you know the vitamin deficiency uh, all the, the ordinary uh, symptoms that people suffer from exaggerated and there was a death rate of five per fortnight. And this shocked me. I, in a mental hospital, you know, not many patients die. They live on to great ages. You know, in a mental hospital, you'd find a lot of patients a hundred and over a hundred years of age. But here they were dying, dying like flies. And I, I, I was shocked. I even had to be, become accustomed to laying out these patients. And after getting used to the initial shock, I started to wonder. And I had talked to the elder members of the staff and they said, look, you can't do anything for them. Once you're an alcoholic, you remain an alcoholic and you die of alcoholism. And I found this a bit hard to accept. And fortunately at that time, or rather unfortunately for the people involved, there was a lot of uh, scandals uh, involving older members of the staff and there was a, a series of, of inquiries and a number were discharged. 
And I jumped up the seniority ladder very quickly. And I was able to do something about it. Well, in 1944, if there's anyone here that's uh, connected with the medical profession, they will remember that a drug, a series of drugs came out called uh, the sulfur drugs. And the first one of these was uh, a drug, it only had a number, 650, 750 or so. And this drug, it, it cured in a miraculous way pneumonia. Now, an alcoholic coming out of the DTs in such a debilitated condition that he was affected immediately by pneumonia and he died, died quickly. So we immediately, this drug was was easily available to us and we started giving this drug. As a man came out of the DTs, we put him onto this drug immediately and it was a miracle, a near miracle. The death rate dropped by more than half. Now, at wartime, you know, all sorts of drugs become available. Medicine jumps forward in about a couple of decades over a couple of years. And vitamins. You know, in 1943, 1944, there's only A, B and C. And if you had a lot of money, you could afford to buy one of these vitamins. Uh, the CSRA over at Piermont started making it by the tons for the use of the of the armed services, you know, for the for the injured people, and it became available to us, and we started whacking this vitamin into the patients, the recovering patients, and the death rate dropped lower still, and around 34, 35, you know, the first of the tranquilizers came out. I think the ones that preceded Largactyl, and we started giving these. And by 1944, our death rate had dropped down to half of 1%. Now, this was a miracle. But a strange thing happened. You know, I, I felt very pleased about this because I had pushed things along and the young men that had replaced these old men that were discharged, they were the the men, the result of the higher educational standards, of the better educational system, and the syllabus of the psychiatric nurse, we were only called attendance then, it had been improved, and they were willing to back me in this. But we were flattened, completely flattened. These people that we were curing were coming back. All we were doing was curing them so they could come back and there was more coming back and our job was getting worse because we... So I realised I had to start reading again. So one night, I remember this night because it was a turning point in my life, I, I was in charge of the, of the place and uh, there was a, a, a quiet half hour and I put my feet up on the desk and sat back and I picked up a American Journal of Psychiatry that was on my desk and I started to leaf through the pages and I came across an article <coughs> called The Therapeutic Mechanism of Alcoholics Anonymous and I read this through then later in the night I picked it up and I read it through again and I, I was I was a bit rough uh, you know, uh, what they were doing with these alcoholics, they were, there was a tremendous amount of experimental work in which the alcoholics were the victims of. Uh, the shock machines now had just come in, you know, and they were hitting them with a buzz, as we called it, and all that left them was uh, a loss of memory for a couple of weeks afterwards and a greater first. Uh, <laughs> They had this prolonged narcosis, which they're still fooling around with, and that was making them. Some of them even get didn't get over that. Uh, then uh, they had a whole in those years. I, I would say, at a, at a rough guess, there must have been four or five hundred different drugs 
become available for the treatment of people in these conditions. And nothing worked. But because I, my training period had covered Freud and uh, Adler and Steckel and Jung and all those people, I was orientated towards that type of thinking. And when I read down these 12 steps, to me it seemed ridiculous that uh, 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 these things here could do what all these mechanical aids, chemical aids couldn't do. So, uh, I, I thought about this article for uh, over a week and I thought, now here goes. So I wrote to the editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry and I asked him, would he forward me any information on Alcoholic Anonymous? Well, the war was on, you know. And about three months later, I got a book addressed to Dr. McKinnon. And <laughs> it was this book. But just after I had gone off, or at the end of that period of night, I was injured by a patient. And it was fairly serious, and I was off work for six months, and I was home uh, in bed most of the time. Darcy, my wife, worked, and uh, she used to lug me, come home at lunchtime, and get me on my feet. You know, and I, I'd walk around, and I, I had a very bad time. But I read this book, you know, and I, I, I was confused. I, I didn't mind telling it. Uh, case histories that were in this book I had written down. And I did understand the Greek therapy aspect of it because the year before, am I taking up a lot of time? Uh, <laughs> well, the, uh, the year, uh, you know, when the New Guinea, uh, New Guinea campaign was on, the American soldiers that suffered from what they called combat neurosis. They used to put them on a plane and they'd send them straight back to America. But they found this was, uh, there were a lot of problems associated with it, so they sent a trial half dozen down to us at the reception house. When I come on this morning, I, I found these six Yanks under my care. They weren't, you know, they weren't bad fellas. Pretty nervous lot. And about nine o'clock, an American psychiatrist, he was a colonel in the American Psychiatry Army Service, you know these long titles the Yanks have, and beautifully, beautifully dressed. You know how those American upper brass, they were beautiful. Anyone, no wonder the, the Australian girls went from them, they were so lovely. Uh, I said to him, what are you going to do with these guys? He said, well, uh, he said, are you looking up? And I said, yeah. He said, well, look, I'll be back in half an hour. He said, I'm going to try something with them. I said, what are you going to try? He said, I'm going to try a thing called uh, group therapy. And I said, what the hell's that? And he said, well, I don't know a great lot about it, he said, but it's been terribly successful with the alcoholics in America. So my ears, you know, picked up. So he came back in half an hour, and, and the six of the eight bed. He sat in one bed, and I sat in the other. And we got these fellows sitting on their bed, and we started to talk about uh, the neurotic conditions, the fear, the panic that, that affects men in active service. You know, when they're under fire. And these fellows opened up terrifically. They started to talk how they felt. They had felt that they were the only one that felt this panic, you know, this fear, this fear of dying. So he said to me, you're going pretty well. He said, uh, are you here uh, tomorrow? And I said, yeah, well, I manipulated my day, so I was there for every every day. And at the end of a week, five out of the six were pretty good. In fact, they were that good they were sent back to New Guinea. One of, them was, <laughs> one of them wasn't so good. I don't know what they did with him. But I did know something about group therapy. 
And that was all that I, I could see some benefit in this book. So, uh, I had a friend, I, I think Alan and Norman, his name was Bill. He's long since dead. He went to school with me. We were, uh, we remained friends, even though he had the biggest dossier in the department for his alcoholism. And Bill was in there and he, he said to me, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, look, I've got a book, book here. I'd like you to read it and tell me what you think about it. And he was on his way to Morissette the following morning. So when I come on the following morning, I said, you read that book? He had a sheet of, of, of notes. I said, what he got there? He said, well, I have copied out paragraphs out of that book that uh, tell me that this is the only way to recover from alcoholism. Well, this rocked me but it did influence me terrifically. So, for the next, I was back at work. I just come back to work. For the next month, I looked over every alcoholic patient coming in, and there's a whole tribe of them. Most of them knew me. And I didn't want to go and say, look, I've got a cure for your alcoholism. Because they would have said, no, poor old Mac, you know, the job is got him. <laughs> so, this fella came in this day, and everyone was very wary of him. He had been in once before, and that was five years ago, and he was such an unpleasant character that they were all wary of him because his father was the governor of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. And uh, so I said, look, Rex, how are you? I went to a lot of trouble. I, could un I can unashamedly admit I put him through a softening period. I did everything for him. I... I was practically his slave. But I put him in a position that he was under great obligation to me. Uh, on, the, on the second day, third day, I saw he was fairly well. Or he was recovering. And I said, Rex, will you read this book? Well, he couldn't refuse. Yeah. So he read the book and I was off the next day and the next day I came on. I said, Rex, did you read that book? He said, yes. He said, I said, what do you think of it? He said, well, it's the only answer to alcoholism. He said, I would like to join this fellowship. And I said, well, Rex, I'm sorry. Uh, this is not yet, not yet in Australia. You will be the first member if you started. And I said, I will help you. I said, we will start the first group in Australia. And that's how it started. Now, I had thought that this book I had got was the first book that ever came to Australia. But it wasn't. A medical superintendent of my own department named Dr. Sylvester Minogue, he had got a book uh, uh, some months before. I can't just recall the exact date. But as medical superintendent, he had been trying to involve the inebriate patients under his care uh, in this AA group. Well, a medical superintendent is right up top, you know. In those days, he was like the governor of a jail. And he had very little contact with the patients. And he had very little chance. You see, AA, is a, it's, a, it's a personal thing. You know, you meet someone that's a member of AA and he talks to you about it. He tells you about it. You are a living example and so on. He couldn't do any of those things. See? And at the same time, there was a Catholic priest who was well known because he had started an organization called Boys Town, which was a terrific success. Everyone in Australia knew about Boys Town. And he also wanted to uh, branch into this field of alcoholism. He didn't mention that he had a personal problem with it, and neither did Dr. Minogue. But <laughs> I, ha I had a group of four within a matter of a, a week or ten days. And things, you know, through government departments, you know, 
the smoke signal's going up everywhere, you know. And they soon found there's a fella up at the reception house was trying to cure alcoholics, and he followed it up. And he, Father Dunley rang me and he said, I'd like to meet you. I believe you've got a group. And I said, yeah. And he had a sort of a group. He had a little fella called, uh, I know that you remember him, Alan Wally Ling. Uh, they weren't doing so well together. And uh, Dr. Minogue's story was quite another story. Uh, <coughs> we got together <coughs> and in a matter of months we had a very good group at Walker Street, North Sydney. Now this is a story of Alcoholics Anonymous in the first year. Uh, an interesting sidelight to it, after we had been associated for a matter of about eight or nine years, I thought I'd better come clean with Dr. Minogue and I said, Doc, do you, do you remember when he used to come down to Morissette and examine the first year student nurses? And he said, oh yes, I was doing it for years. I said, uh, did you know I was one of those students? Uh, he said, I passed you, didn't I? And I said, well, yes, you did. <laughs> I said, but you didn't remember me, did you? He said, no, I never failed anyone in my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that's, uh, that will give you some sort of a lead in, you know, to Sylvester Minogue. Uh, Alan, thanks for giving me the opportunity of speaking. It's been a great pleasure. Again, I will say that this weekend has been one of the most, and for my wife, does here, who's not here at the moment, for both of us, the whole of our way of life altered. I think maybe we did become... I hope better people. Our life has been richer and fuller. And I have a sneaky sort of a feeling that uh, uh, I have a feeling that you know, our excuse for being alive is what we can do for our fellow men. And I feel that maybe I made some small contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Arch, and thank you all you wonderful people for that demonstration of love to Arch. Uh, I'm pretty emotional now, too. Uh, no, I'm not behind it. Uh, when Pat introduced... <coughs> I've got to stick to this. When Pat introduced me, uh, he said I might like to get somebody to read the, the Chapter 5 part of how it works. So I have to make a decision in this situation. We're running out of time. I believe I have until half past ten. So you'll have to find out how it works or somebody else. <laughs> uh, I'd like to call a local boy, Urala Bill of Armadale. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. And uh, I don't know that uh, I qualify as an old-timer, but uh, I'm Bill Alcoholic. And uh, I'm a very grateful member of AA. Uh, as time is running out, I'll briefly go through my story. I started drinking very early in life, and uh, right from my very first drink, I was unable to control my drinking. And through this lack of control, I was to lose everything that I cherished, the love of my family, my position in that family, and uh, my position in the uh, family heritage, which didn't matter that great much. But uh, as time went on, I was to lose a lot more that was a lot more important to me. I was to lose dignity, uh, self-respect, and everything that really I cherished above everything else. I become a derelict. 
not through my own choice, and I might I like to emphasize that. I went places and I did things and I behaved in a manner all against my better judgment and my will. But I was unable to do a thing about it. And my drinking took me all over Australia. And some of the jobs that were mentioned here by Arch, I've done them all. I had to, to survive. And uh, through my excessive drinking, I eventually qualified for Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I really believe, and I do believe this, that I would have qualified for AA at the age of 18 because my drinking was completely and utterly out of hand at that age, although I didn't know it then. And I, in this uh, interval from the time I, I realised that my drinking was causing havoc in my family and what have you, I'd tried all sorts of means to, to, to not actually stop my drinking, but they cut it down, and I couldn't. I took pledges and I took prohibition orders at it, and I'd been in the places where Archie worked. I'd had the key to Bloomfield Hospital at Orange at one stage. I'd been what uh, uh, Archie described as a mental attendant. To, and I left there because I was frightened I'd get locked up there. And they, they used to tell funny stories why I left. And the, uh, the common one was that I, I got the sack because I was sending the patient silly. <laughs> but, uh, and that could well have been the case. But uh, eventually, fortunately for me, I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. And this has been the turning point of my life. Life began for me when I, I uh, qualified through the third tradition that I had an honest desire to stop drinking. And I became a member by the application of the first step that I admitted that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life was in a complete and utter shambles. But unfortunately for me, uh, I was to drink again after nearly two years. And uh, that was a very, very devastating period for me because I, all sorts of things went through my mind I believed, as I'd heard chapter 5 and I'd read chapter 5, that there were people, people that were incapable of being honest with themselves and I'd conned myself into believing that I was one of these. And I didn't believe that I could get back to AA and in a funny sort of a way, this is the dishonesty of me as an alcoholic, I believed AA hadn't worked for me. But in sheer desperation, I had nowhere else to go. I came back with the tail between my legs. Unfortunately for me, I haven't had a drink from that day to this. And I don't take any credit for that because all I did was give in and become willing to work the program as it was suggested that I did work. One day at a time, not picking up one drink at a time. And it's been beautiful. It's been really wonderful, and it's wonderful to be here this morning to be able to share and care with you people on this gut level, and this is the thing I love. AA has been very, very kind to me, uh, and it hasn't been hard, really, because if it was, I wouldn't be here sober, and it's as simple as all that, as Long John said. If it was hard, we couldn't do it. We alcoholics won't do and bloody will nothing that's hard. <laughs> and this I believe too so it has to be easy and uh, for this I'm very very grateful and I won't take any more of your time, thank you very much for Thank you Bill <clears throat> I promised that I'd put that call over again for Irina and has she come in by any chance? Or Anne, has Anne come in? Anyhow, if any of you do run into her, some effort has probably been made. Uh, she is to ring her husband, either at home or at, I don't know if it's her parents, she will know, her parents or his parents' place. Uh, probably around the back. On this, the time has run out. <coughs> I'm going to go five minutes over. I'm not going to go five minutes over. Hopefully somebody else will go five minutes over.
not a quarter of an hour over. But we had the uh, the Governor General last night. I think it's fitting that we should have one of his loyal Canberra subjects. Uh, Beth from Canberra, please. Can you ask him, can he drop this? Good morning, everybody. I'm Beth, and I'm an alcoholic. I imagine. In age, yes, I do belong to the Alzheimer's, but in sobriety, not so long. It, I came to this fellowship through Morissette Hospital in 1970. And I left there because... I had a hope in my heart. I did not know what was wrong with me. My whole life had disintegrated. I, as a person, had disintegrated. I was no longer... uh, had the qualities of a woman, those that a woman treasures. But I, through the continual meetings that I attended of Alcoholics Anonymous there, I had this wonderful hope that perhaps I could go back to the life that I had once lived. That was not to be, of course, and I can say this, I believe, for every alcoholic. I went to Newcastle I was no longer wanted at my home in Lane Cove. And there I was taken into a circle of love. Every person in that fellowship, our chairman here, especially amongst them, they enfolded me with love. They knew that I needed the protection and I needed some care. I needed a gentle leading hand to take me along this new path. And time went on. I still didn't really believe that I was an alcoholic because I hadn't done any terrible things, come in contact with police or, you know, been on any charges or anything. I'd merely been put in my reset. I know now for my own protection. Uh, But I did have the requirement for membership. I honestly didn't want to drink again ever. And that was why immediately I left that institution, I found Alcoholics Anonymous in Newcastle. And I have continued to to do, to be as part of this fellowship as much as I possibly can in the last 12 years. No, it hasn't been hard. It's been a joyous journey, an enriching, rewarding one. And as I said before, I thought that I would be restored to the person that I had been Actually, it was only the the last three or four years that I drank, that I drank a great deal. Um, Prior to that, it was a very on and off affair. But anyone who has tried to follow this program of Alcoholics Anonymous can never go back to what they were before. They've found an enrichment and a wonderment and a beauty in their life, if they choose to take it. I chose to take it, and I hope that this will continue to develop in me because I want it so much. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. (coughs) Now, the usual thing to say is that I've enjoyed the meeting. There are a wonderful lot of people. So I do say it. I have enjoyed the meeting, and you are a wonderful group of people. Uh, your demonstration towards Arch McKinnon was beautiful. It was lovely, 
Uh, and I know, because I'm so close to him, I know just what it would mean to us. So you are a tremendous audience. And I thank you for it. You've been a tremendous audience for me because I was as nervous as hell. I'm still shaking, but not as badly. And you have helped me uh, go through this meeting, and I believe it's been a very wonderful meeting. I've never gotten anything like even some of the names that were handed me. I haven't called any of the people except one that I know are here from Sydney and I know, or that I knew long ago. Uh, now, I'm sorry for that, but you can only do a certain amount of things. Uh, I don't know what the procedure is at this meeting. I don't know whether you put a couple of bob on the drum or not. That's entirely up to yourself. Uh, whether this is going on at these meetings, I don't know. But anyhow, if you feel like putting a couple of bob on the drum, it will be used and used in the right way. Uh, again, thanks for being the uh, audience that you are. And will you all stand and join me in the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.